Ah, it's hurting. I probably will if I see it. Uh, cheese maker, cheese maker there. Well, I'll ask you that. See, I'll kind of interrupt and just kind of hold on it. I'll ask you what's going on, you know, things like that. And then the butter ring was in the corner, you know. Yeah, 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 sure. I could tie it. Why don't you take his paper out of his pocket? Oh, sorry about that. That's okay. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Well, good afternoon, Evan. Good afternoon, John. I haven't seen you for quite a while. That's and, for uh, sure. And uh, we did a lot of business together when you were up there going around there, sold you a lot of cream. That's right. And you helped an awful lot, showing me how to make Italian cheese. I always used to come up there and get some advice from you. And today, I'd like to have a little conversation, an interview with you, uh, telling how you got started in cheese making, because you got, I know you have such a repertoire of different types of cheeses, and we're trying to show how many different types were made right here in this Green County area. Everybody thinks it was all Swiss around here, and the creameries were from Northern Illinois. So this afternoon, we're going to interview Evan Appleman. May 16, 1995, and we're doing this for the Historical Cheesemaking Center, and Dr. Hein will bid you this for our future generations to see. Well, Evan, uh, how did you ever get started in this dairy business? Well, I started in this uh, to working for my uh, uncle, which was a butter maker. So I went in to help him. I was around 15 years old and he needed somebody to kind of help him run the plant there. So I was like to be the one. So they started pretty young in those days, didn't they? Oh, they sure did. You had to make a buck wherever you could. So <laughs> that's why I got started there. So. Okay, then so you worked for your uncle and then did you uh, continue to work at the creamery or? Yeah, I worked for the creamery there for a while yet. Uh, the, the man that owned the creamery was a cheesemaker. And he decided if he had to pay me, well, I should be over helping him make cheese. And that's why I got started in the cheese business. Well, how much butter did you make? Did you churn it there at the, uh, that time, or one churn a day, or a couple of weeks? Uh, I would say we churned in the summertime, at least a churning a day. Time you slacked off by the way. A lot of the farmers would separate and bring the cream in. The roads were bad, especially. The roads weren't too good back then either. Now that's back in what year would you say? Well, I would say it was about 19. I started in the uh, butter when I was about 15, about 31, and then I switched over to the cheese in, in the summer of uh, 32. Too. And up in what area was this at, Evan? Uh, it was up in Lafarge, Wisconsin, up in the Kickapoo Valley. That's up near Baroque, right? Yes, yeah, 15 miles from Baroque. And that's where you started the butter business. Now, were there, did they pick up a lot of cream from the factories there, or were there just no, a lot of farmers? There was a lot of farmers in, in those uh, days that separated. Yeah. Well, that's pretty hilly country out there. I uh, imagine the dairy business hadn't really got that great for cheese making. That's that was right. just coming in, and that's right. The creameries were at the start. Yeah, that's what, that's what happened. Were there a lot of creameries, Evans, in different towns? Or yes, pretty near every small town had a creamery. And, uh, so I would say in the Vernon County at that time that there was probably at least four or five, maybe more. Uh, scattered throughout the county. Creameries that yeah. just made butter yeah. and, and then eventually they went into the cheese. Yeah, you yeah. know, a lot of that, yeah. Well, then your uncle says, well, you want you to make some cheese then. Shall we go into that? Tell me about that then. Yeah, that's uh, about what he done. He went to, uh, he 
got him a factory out out in the country, the Otter Creek Cheese Factory. And this was so, located where? Uh, just a little ways out of Lafarge, and uh, about five miles out of Lafarge, about ten miles to Europa. And uh, I helped him make cheese out there for a year or so. And from there I went uh, over to Pleasant Ridge Cheese Factory and uh, Rison County up in there, West Lima. And I worked there until 1939. Well, that's cheddar country up in there. Yeah, it's all what you made up there. Everything was cheddar. Uh, and then how many farmers do you think you had about that time? You know, uh, the average factory? Well, I would say probably 30, 35, somewhere yeah. in there. Yeah. There were mostly small factories around. 35 was a lot of farmers, yeah, of course, yeah, so they didn't yeah. get too much milk. No, none of them had much milk. And some places you'd stop and pick up milk, it wouldn't be over a half a can at <laughs> certain times of the year. So it was pretty well scattered around. Well, then where'd you sell your cheddar? Uh, mostly went to uh, Smith Brothers. Uh, there was a subsidiary of Borden Company. They bought cheese for them. And your butter went? Well, I went in Chicago. It used to be the Fox Butter Company. And a lot of them went there. Or, uh, except what we printed out for stores throughout the area. Well, then as time progressed, I suppose you became a young man and you got married? That's right. I got married in 1939. I uh, went and applied for a job at the Fargo Cheese Factory at the uh, uh, outside of Baroque, and, and uh, they looked at my credentials and they said, well, if you're married, uh, the job is yours. So <laughs> adding a little humor to it, I, I uh, had, uh, went my girlfriend at that time, uh, was high school sweethearts, and so uh, I said, I don't know whether you know or not, but we're getting hitched. I got a job. <laughs> she says that was a very romantic most romantic words I've heard from years. <laughs> so anyway, I guess it was all right because it's lasted for 56 years the first of March. So congratulations. Well, any other interesting stories that you can think of while we're talking about, you know, accidents or whatever it is that's in human interest, so you have to run across one. Don't be afraid to share it with us. Well, uh, the, the fellow I started for uh, there, and, uh, I bought a new pair of shoes before I started helping make cheese. And he looked at my shoes and he said, I want to tell you something, young fellow. He says, if you ever get milk on them shoes, you'll never get it off. It took me years to figure out what he was talking about, but I finally did. So, uh, but he was, then that, in them days there were a lot of small factories. And he says, now when you learn to make cheese and get out, he says, get you a factory where you got to have at least one hired man. Because he says if something goes wrong, I can blame it on the hired man. He says that's the reason I got you. <laughs> and he was a very humorous guy to work for. It's fun to work for. So. Yeah. On the shoes, you meant that once you get started, the business is hard to That's right. Yeah. That's right. And it became your life. That's, that's right. right. And all your life, you made, you made the cheese, and then, well, then you after you got that job at the creamery. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, how big a factory was that? Then? Well, at that time, I I suppose we was probably twenty thousand so tops. But you just made cheese, no butter. It was a straight well, out cheese factory. Well, no, no. Uh, which factory are you talking about? Uh, the one that you moved into after you got married. Oh, that was uh, just the cheese plant. That was a cheese factory, and we'd run around the. Uh, well, we got up to forty thousand. So it's a big factory. Yeah, yeah it was a good size. Ten thousand pound bags. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a big factory. Yeah, it was a okay. good sized factory. You always had pretty good cheese, did you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, everything was raw milk cheese in these days. Well, you never have any gas and have to work. Oh, well, right? many, many times. The wife would say, Well, what time will you be home tonight? And I'd say, Well, it depends on how much gas we have in the summertime, especially. Can you kind of explain this to us here, for some of us here, this historic Monroe Center later on, what you're talking about, uh, this gas, if... Uh, well, if the, if the milk was, wasn't 
too good a quality on uh, performing a little gas bubbles in the cheese. And of course, the only way you could work that out is turning and waiting until you got enough uh, uh, acid, they call it, to offset it. Offset. And then you wash it and poke it and try to, try to work out of it so you can get a fairly good grade of your cheese. Uh, we used to call that cheddaring, I think. Yeah, cheddar. You just kept right. slabbing it, you cut it in slabs, and kept turning it and turning it and finding that that unfavorable bacteria where it finally ran its course and then you could hook it. And if you did get that yeah. gas out of there, what happened to the press? Well, the cheese would buckle and then the next morning why uh, the cheese would start raising like bread if you didn't get it out. So. I've even heard some stories where they blew the press right up. Mm -hmm. It can get awful powerful. Oh, they sure can. They sure can. get the bubbles. They sure can. Okay, then from there, moving right along, uh, to your next factory, and how did you get down here to uh, maybe just hit which factories you went to and maybe where they're at? Um, well, I came to Broadhead, and uh, that was a, known at that time as a Golden Rock Creamery Company, and cheese was their sideline there. Mostly butter at that time. Was that a cooperative or was it all? No, it was privately owned. Privately owned. And this factory that you had just left, that was, what was that? That was a privately owned. I, was, I always you had to buy out. Then. Yeah, I worked, I always worked in privately owned cheese plants. And, uh, and you had to pay the farmer more or less with yeah, the cheese right. made. And that's correct. Yeah. So down through this area, pretty much everything was co op. Mm -hmm. Privatization was just starting to come into that's being right. there. That's right. That's right. And they made Swiss cheese here. They used to have to wait two months for that. My sure. Yeah, it wasn't so bad. You could no. ship that. How quick could you ship that out there? Well, you could ship that in, in easy in a, a week. In a week. Yeah. You could it to yeah. Out. Yeah. 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 Ship it out. Did you ever make many barrels then, or were you making them all? Like, no, I never made barrels. It was mostly blocks and cheddar itself. They weigh all the way from 72 to 75 pounds. The old-fashioned cheddar, which was in that circular. Yeah, they were, we built a lot of muscles lifting those cheddars around. <laughs> all right, well, tell me a little bit about Goldenrod. That's where I met you there. That's where I met you at Goldenrod. And, and, uh, that became quite a plant there. Uh, you bought that plant there, or did you work for something? Uh, well, what happened there, uh, and, uh, there was two brothers that actually owned that, and then uh, one brother bought uh, bought out the other one, and uh, so uh, it became uh, known as the H.E. Shepherd and Company, and uh, then and Shepard was one of the brothers, right? Yes. So that was yes. his name. Yes. He owned that. He owned that up until 1969 when uh, Universal Foods Corporation purchased it, and it was known as a, uh, as a Stella Cheese Company. Then. And this was all Italian. Then, yeah, that all time. like that. Okay, so when you first came to Broadhead, there they were making mostly what? Well, we made uh, cheddar, of course, and uh, Colby, and then uh, we started making cheese for Kraft, you know, and we got into brick and the burger. A lot of forms. Yeah, out. we, uh, you name it, we made it for Kraft, and uh, so they'd come teach us how to make it, and we'd start out from there. Well, was that really always the cheese factory? It had two stories in there, or was no, that the, uh, converted the, to something? The upper part was uh, was the butter end, and the lower part was the cheese end. And uh, as the years went by, why the cheese was better than the than the butter, and finally we quit making butter altogether and went in entirely into cheese. Now we use both floors for for the cheese operation. And in, in the butter part. Uh, um, in the butter department, uh, you picked up a lot of cream from different factories. That's how right. many factories do you think that you had at one time? Well, if you if you know about how many factories that we had there around uh, in that area, and there was a lot of them, we got the cream from those factories. That was a, considered at that time a large cream. And we made uh, the uh, milk end wasn't all that big at that time, probably 
20,000 flush was all we made in there at that time. The butter was the mainstay. Yeah. Then, then came this attack. Yeah, and then we grew it from about 20,000 pounds of milk until, until, we, until I retired and got up to around uh, half a million pounds of milk a day in the cheese. 500,000 yeah. pounds a day. Three versus 20,000 yeah. pounds of milk. I mean, uh, what an increase. That's what technology can do. All right, tell us a little bit about the talent here and there. Then uh, after making cheddar, that kind of works a little bit uh, with cheddar. The early talent, they used to um, cheddar that or mat it out. And, and they always said a good cheddar maker could make good Italian cheese. And that's what they always claimed. That, uh, but uh, it, it was easier to make than uh, I thought than cheddar. So uh, they didn't have that back breaking. They didn't wait quite as much time. It seemed a lot nicer that way. So. Well, then you carried a pretty strong culture then. Too, yeah, that's you know? that's been, yeah. But then there was that mixing you had to get that. Yeah, everything was mixed by hand when you when we started making mozzarella. Of course, we made a lot of high grading or hard grading cheese. And that's Parmesan and, and, uh, and Romano also, right? We yeah. had the warehouses in Monroe here. Of cheese, we probably had a million pounds of cheese curing lots of times, and you had to hold that for about a year before you could ship or you wanted it for grading. So uh, it took some economic backing there or something. Yeah, it's somewhere. That's the reason I kind of stayed out of that. <laughs> didn't have as many headaches. It's a lot of, lot of storage, you know, a million yeah. pounds. All right, uh, now this Italian, you saying that you stirred it in the tubs first with hot water to put that stretch in, right? That's right. Well, if I recall right, you were one of the first ones that uh, got into the mechanics there in a mixer. Yeah, there. we were. We were one of the first ones that got into mozzarella here in, in Green County. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, and it was, and after that, then there were several people started. And most of that went to, where did you ship that to then? Most of the, well, we had our own private customers. Some, a lot of them went to New York City, or a lot of them went to Chicago, places like that. So. Well, they said uh, there was a lot of stories that uh, a lot of this Italian was controlled by the mafia. Was there a little something to that in some areas? Well, I never seen it. In, it could have been in some areas, but I never seen it in around here. You know, almost any seemed to. You know, they pretty much left us alone. Well, uh, Evan, you've seen a lot of changes from the cheddar and the, to the Italian and brick and Munster and uh, uh, this Italian has really been something a boom, I would say, to the dairy industry. Oh, it sure has. Um, Jim, I grew up with, did you ever hear of Parmesan or Romano or any of those cheeses from you? Never did. Never did. I, oh, never did. I, uh, I came down there for the purpose of learning more how to make some of this uh, other types of cheese because uh, I know Kraft and some of them are always helping to start in different types. And I was going to stay two years and go back, but I'm still there. <laughs> still that was in the 60s, then, right? It was in the, when you started making town in there, you said in the 50s. Yeah. Um, you had to be one of the first ones. Well, I was talking to Doc Heiner, and he said you were a cheese grader too. I didn't really realize that. Yeah, yeah. I uh, took a leave of absence in 1962, and uh, I didn't like the traveling, and so I came back, uh, took over as manager again in '65. So uh, then I stayed there until my retirement in 1982. Well, you sure got a lot of history then. Uh, well, I, you know, sometimes uh, it just seems like in families, you went to your uncle to make cheese. And uh, it, sometimes those things kind of stay in the family. Yeah, right? they do. And you have two sons. Two sons in the cheese business. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you tell me where they're at now? No, well, I have one son in uh, Monroe who works for Avonmore Cheese Company, and then I have uh, one son that's uh, a director of all cheese operations for uh, Beatrice Cheese. 
And then he works out of Milwaukee and they have several plants throughout the United States that he has to take care of or look, look after. So uh, that's more or less his job. Well, you can be pretty proud of him because uh, I know them both. And uh, um, especially that one in there with Beatrice. And I got to rent that place out there at uh, Preston and then Fredericksburg. And then the next thing I heard, he's running the whole operation. And now he's way up there in the chairman of the board or something like that up there in the big wheel. And the other son here in Monroe, uh, it's funny how it goes. I just met him skiing here the other day down in Chestnut. That's what he tells me. <laughs> tells me it's a gully of run across it by accident. <laughs> and, you know, uh, Evan, we have to say this. Uh, we have to get this in here before we close this uh, interview up here. Kind of miss you up here at the uh, Cheatmakers Convention. I didn't see you at the last one. Well, I tried to get up here. Uh, I was a little late one day. I uh, got up here a little late in the afternoon, but I did get up here. Oh, yeah. Well, when, when, we, when you retired there at uh, Golden Rod, I always look forward to seeing you up there at the Wisconsin Cheesemaker Association. I guess they kind of call it the United States Cheesemaker. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Good to see you again. And we'll have a little visit in a while. Glad to see you again, John. Put her there. Good to see you. Bye.